There are so many innovative plasterboard fixings on the market right now which can make it really difficult for us DIYers to decide which one to use for a particular job. In my old day job fitting curtains and blinds it was crucial to get a decent fixing in plasterboard so I've learned quite a lot about this subject over the years and in today's video I'm going to pass on to you some of those tips and tricks and then I'm going to run through what I think are some of the best fixings currently available including those that work well in insulated plasterboard and I'm also going to highlight a few to avoid. And finally I'll be subjecting each fixing to an identical load test to see which performs best. And for today's test I've constructed this stud wall mock-up using a full sheet of 12mm plasterboard with studs positioned at a typical 24 inches or 600mm apart. Now sounds obvious but your journey to the perfect fixing starts with you working out what sort of wall you've got and a simple tap test can tell you a lot. For example I stripped the lath and plaster off this wall a couple of years ago and replaced it with two layers of 12mm plasterboard. Tap it and it's consistently hollow apart from where you hit a stud. More on that in a minute. On this wall on the other hand the plasterboard had to be dot and dabbed or glued to the brickwork because I had so little thickness to work with next to the door frame. And you tap this wall and you get a very different sound. A higher hollow pitch but lots of solid noises where I'm tapping the dabs or adhesive blobs behind the plasterboard. And this wall where I dot and dab insulated plasterboard has another sound again. Now plasterboard is inherently brittle which does not make it an ideal material to fix into. So wherever possible you should try and locate the stud work or brick behind. So let's start with a few tips on finding studs. And taking this stud wall here as an example there are a few ways you can locate that stud. So taking a line across this wall here that sounds quite solid and then that sounds hollow. And I use this technique quite a lot in the old day job. But you can't always guarantee a stud where you've got a solid tap. So you could combine this technique with one of these, a super strong magnet. And trailing this magnet across the wall, suddenly the magnet finds some metal behind. And what the magnet's latching onto here is either a screw or perhaps in a more traditionally constructed wall, the nails attaching the lath to the studs. The next option you can use is a stud or metal detector. Personally, I've never used a stud detector and reviews of stud and metal detectors like this Bosch multi-scanner are at best mixed. And to be honest, in my own experience over the years in the day job, they've also thrown up quite a lot of false negatives and positives. But one device I have found to be reasonably reliable is this Bosch PMD7. It's a metal detector sadly now discontinued, I think overtaken by the very reasonably priced Truvo, which again, to be fair, has had its share of mixed reviews. But anyway, let me show you how it works. So we've got our magnet here which we think is detecting a stud and if we switch on our metal detector bring it across the wall and if we take our magnet away now the metal detector has found that screw or nail. The other thing you can do and we've done this a lot in the soft furnishings industry when we're hanging heavy stuff like pelmets on ceilings if you know roughly where your shelf is going you can draw a centre line, the point being this will be hidden behind the shelf and then taking a narrow diameter drill bit you can probe along that line until you hit your stud. But the problem with this technique is that that stud is not always going to be in the right place for your bracket, particularly if your brackets, unlike these, have a decorative element to them. So in this situation you are going to have to just rely on the plasterboard and find the best fixing for that job. To decide the right fixing for your job, one of the most important things to do is to weigh up how much space you've got behind the plasterboard. Why? Because the best plasterboard fixings open up behind the plasterboard to anchor the fixing in place. And some need more space than others to do this. And you can do this by drilling an exploratory hole in the plasterboard. Now for this you could use an old HSS bit but as you might hit something like brickwork behind the plasterboard it makes sense to use a masonry bit. The general rule we've used in the soft furnishings business is to start with the smallest bit you can and gradually work up through the diameters if you find the fixing you're using isn't adequate. But you need a bit of room to explore in the plasterboard and for a medium duty fixing the sort of minimum diameter you're looking at is about six millimeters. When you drill the hole in your plasterboard if you hit something immediately or say 20 mil back then you've probably got a dot and dab wall. 
If on the other hand you hit something solid immediately, then the chances are you've hit one of the adhesive dabs itself. In which case, happy days, this is a really strong fixing and you can drill into that with a standard brown plug or one of the universal fixings I'll come on to in a minute to anchor into that big blob of adhesive itself. If there is a small gap, you want to test how deep that gap is with a screwdriver like this or a long piece of wire. And whilst there are plasterboard fixings that can open up in very tight gaps, by far the best thing to do in this situation is to drill right through into the brickwork behind and use something like a core fix. A link to one of my videos on which is coming up on screen now. You could tap a plug through the plasterboard into the brickwork behind, and I have been known to do this occasionally in the old day job before I discovered the core fix. But the beauty of the core fix is it has this steel core which bridges a gap between the plasterboard and the brickwork, which means that when you tighten the screw on the bracket, then it doesn't pull the plasterboard back towards the brickwork behind. As it does quite badly here with that previous example. And in case you're wondering, the maximum depth for a core fix to operate from outside face of plastered wall to block work is 45 millimeters. And it enables you to hang really heavy stuff like we did here with this ornamental bed tester. But if the drill goes all the way through to the chuck like here, you know you've got some sort of stud work. And we'll come on to what plasterboard fixing to use in this situation in a moment. But first, there's a quick trick to find out just how thick your plasterboard is, because a lot of you do ask me this question from time to time. You can easily do this by bending over a piece of wire, paper clip is ideal, poke it into the hole, pull it tight against the back of the plasterboard, and then pinch the wire with your finger and take it out. Measure that gap and that is the thickness of your plasterboard. More often than not, it'll be a standard 12 mil plasterboard, perhaps with a couple of millimeters of plaster skim on top. But occasionally the builders might have doubled up the plasterboard, giving you combined thickness of around about 26 millimeters once you've taken the plaster skim into account. So you know what you're drilling into, you now know what space you've got behind the wall, and it's time to decide what fixing to use. And this will largely depend on how heavy the object is you're attaching. I mean, you could just watch the next section of this video and go for the heaviest duty fixing that I'm gonna show you, but really you wanna have a number of different fixings in your armory, the cheaper ones tending to do your lighter weight work, and the more expensive ones when you've got something really heavy to hang on your wall, like a kitchen cabinet or a TV. Or occasionally when you have these, what we call in the trade, get out of jail moments where the wall is disintegrating and you need a fixing to save the day when everything else has failed. I tell you all this because I've had a lot of people in the past complaining about the price of some of the fixings that I've been showcasing on this channel. And my response is always, yes, this is a couple of pounds, but if you're wanting to hang something heavy duty on the wall and you're not prepared to pay that for a fixing, well, quite frankly, you shouldn't be trying to hang it in the first place. With the odd exception, there is a direct correlation between the price of a fixing and the load that it will take. So I thought in the next section, I'd start on the lighter weight fixings and move up to the heavy duty monsters. And each of these fixings boasts different capabilities under shear, tensile and cantilever force. And the way the manufacturers classify them is quite confusing from kilograms to sort of newtons in some cases. So I'm going to conduct a simple cantilever force test at the end to try and see how these fixings compare against each other. Now, for a long time when I was putting up curtains and blinds, I was a big fan of the Fisher UX6, as indeed were a lot of you after watching my earlier videos and trying them out for yourself. It's universal, meaning you can use it in both brick and plasterboard. And in plasterboard, it cleverly knots up behind the board so as to provide a good secure fixing for light to medium weight applications. Or at least that's the theory. Try as I might, I just haven't been able to get this fixing to knot up properly behind the plasterboard as it should. Even using four millimeter diameter screws, it's very important not to get your diameter too wide, otherwise it will never knot up. Could be because it's very cold in here, the plasterboard might be getting a little bit damp, or it could be the plastic and the fixing not performing at this temperature. But either way, that's no excuse because you could be fixing things to your walls after having them plastered. And look, it just pulls out. So I'm afraid this fixing is unexpectedly dropping off my list of fixings to recommend. Which is no major disaster because five years ago, Fisher introduced a new duo power range of fixing, which kind of made the UX6 redundant anyway. A cleverer design that's also universal, but the difference is it opens up a wider anchor behind the plasterboard. So that's all well and good, but Fisher unfortunately decided to confuse the hell out of us DIYers by changing the dimensions. Whereas the UX6 was a sensible six by 35 millimeters, the duo power starts at six by 30 millimeters. And this little plug is in my experience just too short for 12 millimeter plasterboard. It doesn't knot up properly. And as you can see here, it pulls out just too easily. So if you're buying this, my advice to you is not to go near the six by 30, 
but instead always to get this 8 by 40 millimeter fixing. You will need a wider 8 millimeter diameter drill bit and a 4.5 or 5 millimeter diameter screw. And like the UX6, the idea is you go through the back of the fixing, the screw keeps turning and sucks the fixing back towards the plasterboard, creating the anchor. Now it's worth pointing out they also do these longer 8 by 65 millimeter fixings, which you can see here in this double thickness plasterboard works differently. It doesn't concertina open like the 8x40 does. Although you can't argue that this does provide a very strong fixing. In doubled up plasterboard. While I started with these fixings, well at approximately six pence per fixing, they're the cheapest fixing I'm going to show you today. And their universal application coupled with the price and coupled with just how easy they are to use has made them incredibly popular over the last five years with tradesmen and DIYs alike. Not only that, you can pick these up absolutely everywhere. And finally at this point, I thought I'd mention the Multifix Stella from Tinko. You need a wider 10 mm diameter drill bit and a void of about 35 mm behind the plasterboard and at approximately 64 pence per fixing, the price of these is edging up. But what I love about this fixing is that it's got a steel nut inside, which makes operation of it very efficient and eliminates any of the risk of over tightening that you get with those all plastic fixings. Available in two lengths, the red that you saw here, which comes in two bolt lengths, and also a black for double thickness plasterboard. And it can be also used in brickwork. I love the way this fixing opens up behind the plasterboard and giving it a tug, it feels really firm. The manufacturers say you can support a TV, kitchen cabinet, or even combi boiler with this fixing. So pretty heavy duty, but let's up the ante now and look at the real heavy players in the specialist plasterboard fixings game. Hollow wall anchors take the idea of opening something up behind the plasterboard a little bit further. This time the umbrella's metal and there are five of them. And these were my go-to fixings in the soft furnishings trade whenever I had something heavy to hang. As you'll see from this clip on screen now, you either need a setting tool to open up the fixing, or if you're doing it by hand with a screwdriver, it's crucial you have a turning stop. Best to use the hook you're putting it up with between the fixing and the bolt. Otherwise the fixing will spin around ruining your wall, which could well leave you with a big hole to fill. They come in different lengths depending on how much space you've got behind the plasterboard and also how thick your plasterboard is. But bear in mind that the 37mm anchor, whilst requiring a lot less space to open up behind the plasterboard than the 52mm, also opens up a much smaller anchor behind the plasterboard. Now if you're buying a setting tool and it does make opening the anchors much easier, my advice is go quality because the cheaper ones tend to fail and believe you me I've had a few go in my time. What often happens is the v-shaped lever inside the setting tool is made from soft metal and the bolt just pulls it apart if not properly seated. Now the beauty of the hollow wall anchors is you drill a reasonably small hole considering the size of the anchor that opens up behind the plasterboard. These here for example rely on a 9mm drill bit and crucially you can take the bolt out once you've set the hollow wall anchor in position, which you can't do with the next fixing coming up. And so we move on to spring toggles, another fantastic and even heavier duty fixing than the hollow wall anchor at about 75 pence each, but it comes with a couple of issues. Firstly, you have to drill a large 14 millimeter diameter hole, which leaves the bolt with a lot of play, particularly on vertical surfaces. And once the fixing is inserted, you can't remove the bolt without losing the anchor down the back of the wall. And there's a third issue. If you're using these in lath and plaster, or otherwise where the space in the void is restricted. I have in the past when we've been on jobs, found it very difficult to get that toggle to open out behind the plasterboard. Oh, and a little tip here, courtesy of Gary at G-Fix, another fixing I'll come on to in a minute. If you are drilling into lath and plaster walls, whatever you do, don't be tempted to use a spade bit like this. But because what this does is it splinters the laths and makes a complete mess and a very large hole. And again, I've had that happen to me. Much better if you can to get hold of a nice sharp core drill like this. And the chances are you'll end up cutting a much cleaner hole into the lath. So for the reasons I've given, and in spite of the undoubted strength of this fixing, I hardly ever used it in my days as a curtain fitter. And there's another reason that you don't need to go down the route of using spring toggles. Snap toggles are a much better option, with exactly the same size anchor opening up behind the plasterboard, and therefore the same 14 mm drill bit size. The anchor itself with no moving parts is both stronger and simpler than the spring toggle, and the design whereby you slide the fixing piece up 
what are effectively two zip ties and then snap it off when in position. Firstly means there's no play on the bolt and secondly, crucially, means you can actually remove that bolt without the fixing falling back of the wall. This fixing for me so far is the standout winner and I'm just surprised I didn't use more of these in my old day job because it's so strong. Although I suppose if there is a downside, you do need about 50 mil of a gap behind the plasterboard for it to open out in. Before we leave snap toggles, I thought I'd mention Fisher's own snap toggle equivalent in the form of the Duo Tech 10. Now, whilst we're really in the realms of specialist plasterboard fixings at the moment, this one is universal, designed to work in plasterboard and also brick. And I wonder if trying to make it work in both has led Fisher to compromise on what is otherwise quite a clever design. A few reasons why I say this. Firstly, the plug opens 40 millimeters wide rather than the 50 millimeters you get with the snap or spring toggle. It locks and snaps off, similar to the snap toggle. You've got two metal clamps on the back rather than the much stronger thread designed to catch the bolt in the snap and spring toggles. Although admittedly, try as I might, I couldn't over tighten this with my hand screwdriver. And when you use it in brick, which I've simulated here in the double layer plasterboard, the screw skews out of the side as it can't travel centrally all the way up the plug. So the compression in the brick won't be as good as it is if you use a standard wall plug. Price wise, it weighs in at 69 pence compared with 89 pence for the snap toggle and about 40 pence for the spring toggle. These prices are obviously all approximate. But in spite of that clever design, I can't see why you'd buy this when the snap toggle is so superior. Whilst we're looking at metal fixings, I thought I'd mention an ingenious product that I discovered a couple of years ago. The T-Bolt, and there are a few things I like about this. Firstly, the all-metal construction, apart from this plastic centering plug, which also lengthens to cater for different thicknesses of plasterboard. Secondly, the design means it can be used in walls where the gap between the plasterboard is less than 20 millimeters. But when fully open, and just check out how it opens when you tighten the bolt, it's 45 millimeters wide, just marginally less than that snap toggle. We are drilling a slightly larger hole. A 16 millimeter bit comes in the pack, but that's acceptable when the fixing opens up this wide behind the plasterboard. It's cleverly packaged in different kits to cater for TV mounting. There's a multi-pack with different bolt lengths and heads and brilliantly a picture hanging kit. So if you've got a heavy picture or mirror on picture wire, look no further. And the best part of it, this being a question that comes up a lot on my channel, is it's removable and reusable. All these benefits come at a slightly higher price. You're looking at about £1.25 per fixing if you buy a typical 12 unit pack. Now, before we leave this designer plug, I just want to say a few quick words as a sad obituary for the Schneider Platy plug. I bought a box of these a couple of years ago after an electrician on my channel told me how good they were and they've been pretty much sitting on my desk waiting for me to make this video. And just look at what a clever design they are. Sadly though, when I was researching them for this video, I found out they've been discontinued due to poor sales here in the UK. At around £2.16 each, it could have been the price or possibly just bad marketing. Either way, don't get excited about this fixing because sadly, it's not gonna be around much longer. And so as we near the end of this fixings review, we're back on all plastic fixings. But don't let that put you off because the next two are design and capacity wise amongst the most impressive I've reviewed to date. The first is the Bullfix. It comes in two packs, the Universal for cavity stud walls and dot and dab applications where only seven millimeter cavity is required and the Extra which is a little stronger and can be used for cavity stud walls where a minimum 20 millimeter cavity is required. You're paying around 90 pence and one pound 12 per fixing for the Universal and the Extra respectively if you buy one of these packs. Although as with all fixings featured today, Larger packs are available, which drives the individual cost of each fixing down. So these fixings come with a 20 millimeter drill bit. Again, a larger hole, but this isn't gonna compromise the integrity of the plasterboard, at least for the extra fixing, given the design and length of the wings that open up behind. A centering collar fits securely into the hole you've drilled, and then it's just a question of pushing the fixing into the collar and then inserting the fixing screw that comes in the kit. But you can also use any number 10 or five millimeter screw. For me, I would probably use the Bullfix Extra, blown away as I was by the huge length of this wing, over 80 millimeters, that opens up behind the plasterboard. 
Particularly impressive given that it opens easily in this 20 millimeter gap. It's also pretty amazing that the Universal can open up in gaps of seven millimeters, but in this scenario, I would always prefer to use a core fix to anchor into the brickwork behind. Overall, I'm seriously impressed with this fixing and there's no way I'm gonna be able to pull that out of the plasterboard. This is a true heavy duty fixing that I'd happily use for radiators, TVs, kitchen cabinets, the list goes on. And this one at least was also removable. And so we come to the last major plasterboard fixings review of this video. The G-Fix, which I did an extensive video on two years ago, a link to which is coming up on screen now. You'll be drilling the widest hole of any fixing featured in today's video at 25 millimeters diameter. Look how much cleaner the hole is with a core drill than when we're using that spade or paddle bit. But as with the bull fix, the wing is so wide, this time at a whopping 12 centimeters, it's not compromising the strength of the plasterboard. In fact, this is as close as you're gonna to get to putting an actual patris behind the plasterboard without actually having to remove the whole wall to do it. At £1.86 each, if buying a pack of eight, it's one of the most expensive fixings featured today. But as I said at the start, this fixing is for those jobs where everything else has failed. Or perhaps you want complete peace of mind when hanging something seriously heavy. Installation is a little more involved than the others, but still straightforward. As you feed the wing into the hole you've drilled, then pull on the red cord to pull it up tight against the back of the plasterboard. And then insert the circular plug and central screw so that you can pull the cord out. You do need to pull firmly on the cord to prevent the wing spinning. With the cord gone, you then insert the two smaller screws and then remove the central screw as this is your fixing screw. Although uniquely, you can also self-tap elsewhere into the wing. If your bracket or hook has screws that are close together, and this is something none of the other fixings offer. The other thing you can do with this fixing is use it to refix failed installations in the same position where it's not practical to reposition the bracket using a handmade jig like this to create a new hole over the damaged area. The wing is so wide it will bridge any damage, enabling you to then repair the wall with filler once the job is done. And we did something similar on a curtain install in the Southern Hebrides where the lath and plaster wall had basically disintegrated. And finally, this fixing is also incredibly versatile in varying wall thicknesses. The thicker the wall, the longer the screw you use. It's great in tricky lath and plaster substrates, and by trimming the central plug down, you can even use it for screwing into thin, hardboard walls, doors, or in this case, my son's IKEA floating shelf. To screw an additional storage shelf in from below. It does require a 30 mil cavity, you're not gonna get it in this one, but as I said before, in this situation, I'd be drilling into the brick. It's a fantastic fixing, and my experience since making this video, coupled with yours in the comments below the video, bear testament to this. So that's pretty much it on the fixings review. There may of course be a few of your favorites that you think I've missed. If so, let me know in the comments section below. For example, I used to be a big fan of Fisher's PD-8, which has a bullet that cleverly drives two wings open into the plasterboard. But again, like the UX6, I found it pulled out far too easily when making this vid. There's just not enough opening up behind. I've been secretly quite impressed with the Cobra Driller Toggle, which at £1.28 per fixing is getting on the pricier side. And whilst the Dugfoot has had pretty awful reviews, again, it performed okay, except for swiveling around. So as you can't guarantee the optimum vertical position, this is probably one to avoid. If you like the idea of self-drill fixings, the Cobra is a far superior design. Speaking of self-drilling fixings and things to avoid, in every plasterboard video I've done, I tell you just how dreadful the self-drill or speed plug fixing is, or helter-skelter, as we used to call it in the trade. I actually banned all our fitters from using it. There's nothing opening up behind, just a thread in a very brittle plasterboard. I encountered so many failed installs in the curtain business where these fixings had been used. Also on the avoid list are tappet fixings. I mean, why would you bother with something that's just so flawed? And Dewalt, I know these are only lightweight, but please don't tell people 
Your universal screws are good for plasterboard because they just aren't. And in case you wonder why I haven't featured grip it fixings, I've done videos on these in the past and I just don't like them because the hole you have to drill is too wide considering the very small wings that open up behind. I often get asked what fixings work well in insulated plasterboard. So I thought I'd handpick the four that I thought would have the best chance of forcing themselves open in that foam insulation and put them to the test. I picked the M5 by 52 hollow wall anchor, which I've always told people works well, so fingers crossed. I also thought the T-Bolt would have a decent chance, the Timco Stella Multifix, and finally the Fisho Duo Power 8x40. It's a good challenge this because I really am fixing totally blind and carefully peeling off the insulation, you can see that each fixing has opened up absolutely beautifully. So hopefully that's given you a few pointers for the next time you need to fix into insulated plasterboard. So everything I've told you today is just my opinion and this video would lack its final bite if I didn't pit each of these fixings against each other in one final load test. There are two reasons this is important. Firstly, because if you try and study load figures given for each fixing, there are a confusing jumble of tension, shear and cantilever forces with kilonewtons thrown in just to completely fry your brain. Secondly, it's been really cold here this week as you could probably tell by the way I've been wrapped up. It's not damp in here, but the outdoor weather and this unheated room is bound to have had an impact on the strength of the plasterboard. So any load figures that I achieve are obviously going to be less than any quoted by the manufacturers. But if I subject every single fixing to an identical cantilever force test, then that's fair, right? So I bought these heavy duty scales and constructed a basic load testing machine with a rope, scrap of birch ply for a foot pedal and two basin bolts to hold the scales in position on the bracket. I accept this is a bit crude, but again, what I'm doing is consistently applied to every fixing. Finally, I put this metal strap below each bracket to prevent the bracket base simply cutting through the plasterboard, thereby ensuring that all of the force is instead pulling against the fixing alone. I forgot to do this at the start with the G-Fix, which meant the bracket failed a whopping 18 kilograms earlier than it should have done. And I focused my main camera on the scales and played the results back in slow motion to record the highest weight each fixing could take before it failed. I chose most of the fixings, ignoring the spring toggle because we've got this superior snap toggle, bringing in the Cobra driller toggle out of curiosity to see how it would perform, and also giving the red grip it a chance, being conscious that I've been quite scathing about it. I should point out I'm using their old design here, but I can't see how the new design would have any real impact on the load scores. Coming out on top was the G-Fix, failing at 54 kilograms, closely followed by the snap toggle at 38. The ball fix was close behind in third, and my old favorite, the hollow wall anchor, came in at fourth. And the big surprise for me, the Cobra driller toggle handled impressive 31 kilograms. The T-Bolt was perhaps rather disappointingly sixth, and a nevertheless still impressive 29 kilograms. Next came the Stella at 27, a still impressive load considering the design without that wing opening up at the back, with the Dura power just behind at 25 kilograms, and predictably for me, the grip it was bottom of the table at 22. So how do we sum up after such a long video, which I have to apologize for. I wanted to keep everything under one video to keep this account as comprehensive as possible rather than splitting it up into separate videos. And also I was keen to give you an insight into what I think when I come to fix into plasterboard after my lifetime of experience in the trade. I guess you need to go away, work out what sort of plasterboard wall you've got, studded or dot and dabbed, work out how much space you've got behind that plasterboard, and then choose the fixing that's most impressed you today or which you think would do the job best. I've updated my Amazon storefront with all today's fixings, and as usual, you'll find links to everything in the description below this video, which don't forget you can access on your smartphone by clicking on the little arrow, and on your PC by clicking on the show more button. If you'd like to support me, you'll find a link in the description to, buy, to my Buy Me A Coffee channel, which for £5 a month gives you access to my exclusive Discord members forum, where you can join the fantastically passionate, friendly group of DIYers that's building there. You'll also find that a link to my merch store for some last minute Christmas presents. And finally, if you're new to my channel, it would mean so much to me to have you subscribe. You can do that by clicking on the link here and don't forget to click the bell notification icon so you get notified of all my future uploads. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.